All right, uh, I see we are many of us. So welcome everyone, uh, this is a live webinar titled Young People Redefining the Future of the Democratic Spaces in Africa and organized by the Youth Cafe in partnership uh, with Youth Democracy Cohort and powered by the Europe European Union. I'm really glad we all joined on time. So my name is, uh, my name is Esther Mayende from the Youth Cafe. I have my colleagues in here also. When you check at the you know, participants, you'll see the Youth Cafe. So uh, we are really glad to have you here today and for joining on time. So uh, please let us know who you are and where you are joining us from in the chat box. Just type your name, your country, and your organization in the chat box. So um, I'll be checking the chat box to see who has joined us today. Ah, the first one already. Uh, okay, that name is hard. Nkaziri, Eid from Kenya. Really nice to have you here as the first person we, we know. Just type your name, your country and organization. Name country organization. And it is 11.09 here in Kenya. I'd like to know what time it is in Burundi. Someone is from Burundi here. I saw uh, Dennis from Burundi. We have Abdul from Uganda. Wow, thank you. Yeah, it's 10 a.m. in Burundi. It's 11 in Kenya. Interesting. That just shows how we are all connected. There is Frida from Karani, from Kenya, I mean. Ah, there is Kausa from Zambia. Nice to see you here. So for jo those joining us, we're just introducing ourselves. Just let us know where you are joining us from. Kosika Trust, Nelly Wambui. Nice to see you. Yes, we have Daniel from Uganda. So uh, please keep uh, keep uh, keep introducing yourself in the chat box. And I think uh, we are already 10 minutes into the time. We will go directly um, to share the norms for this uh, engagement today. So as uh, we all know, this is an online or virtual event. So we are going uh, to have some rules to ensure that our engagement is, um, is well. So just to let you know, um, we are all imperfect listeners. So we, we should all be open to uh, listening, be present, actively engage and avoid all distractions. Be polite and wait for your time to speak when your chance is given and engage thoughtfully with others. So um, for the norms, we ask that uh, So we ask that you, you keep your microphones muted mm -hmm. unless you are given an opportunity to speak, then you will raise your hand and you'll be given a chance to speak. And uh, also we ask that you use, utilize the chat box to type in your questions uh, directed, directed to any of the speakers or any of the participants, just type them in the chat box as you are doing now. Uh, we also have a function for French interpretation for those who are joining us from, you know, French speaking countries. I saw someone from Benin, Congo. So when you go to your screen, at the bottom of your screen, there is uh, the, you know, the continent, the continent thing. So just click on it, everyone. I think we can go together. Just click on that thing continent or the world the, the world and then select your preferred language if it is english select english and then mute the original language if it is french select french and mute the original language you will be taken to the french room where you will receive a translation for this whole webinar in french i hope we are fine with that 
So uh, that is it for translation. And then the next thing is that this uh, webinar is going to be streamed live on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you can be able to, uh, you can be able to actually go back and check it on YouTube and our Facebook page. If someone is not able to join on uh, Zoom, we actually ask that you may you can refer to them um, on our, our Facebook and YouTube pages. The pages are there uh, for them to follow us. And then uh, for this webinar, we have um, you know hashtags that we are using that you can uh, you know uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Our Facebook uh, pages are there, and we are using hashtag. Uh, International Youth Day, hashtag the Youth Cafe, hashtag Ignite African Youth Project, hashtag YDC, they'll all be shared in the, in the chat box. So let's be respectful of each other and let's contribute. Our speakers are here. We are excited to have you all. So uh, that's all from me. We'll go uh, directly into um, sharing uh, just a little bit on uh, what the Youth Cafe is. And just a reminder to all speakers, let's all speak a bit, uh, you know, slowly so that the translators can be able to pick up what you are saying and those uh, who speak French can be able to understand. So welcome everyone. Let me see if we all agree in the chat box, use the, the thumbs up, you know, just to know we are together. So I welcome my colleague Moses to just share a brief of what the Youth Cafe is. Uh, thank you very much, Esther, for the uh, a wonderful introduction. So mine is just to take us through an introduction of the Youth Cafe. Yeah, uh, the Youth Cafe is a uh, non-profit pan-African youth organization that focuses on youth empowerment in sub-Saharan Africa. We work with young people in Africa and around the world to foster community resilience, to propose uh, innovative solutions, to drive social progress, uh, to enable youth empowerment and to inspire political change. Uh, our head offices are here in Nairobi at Kitushuru Gardens in, in Kenya, that is. So uh, our headquarters in Nairobi serves as the regional office for Sub-Saharan Africa project implementation, uh, coordination, development of new partnerships and innovative programs, and local engagement with strategic partners such as uh, funders, private sectors, uh, governments, and local communities, and young people. So uh, the youth cave is also the largest community uh, uh, the largest conven convening community of professional of professionals has harnessing youth advocacy policy and research for social economic impact so our strategies have always been to look at uh, today's youth as as an as an opportunity for development and economic growth so the thematic areas uh, in which we empower young people include democracy human rights and governance uh, education, research, and social services, economic growth, uh, health and well-being, agriculture, environmental sustainability, talent development, leadership, and innovation. So these are the categories of young people we work with. Yeah, we categorically work with young people from the ages of 18 to 35, but uh, we give much emphasis on the marginalized, marginalized youth groups. And uh, they are included there. Uh, they include youths with disabilities, uh, refugee youths, that those either are uh, displaced internationally or uh, nationally. So uh, youths from rural communities, youths from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, uh, youths from low social minorities, such as religious minorities or ethnic minorities, uh, those living with HIV and AIDS, and those living in informal settlements, such as slums. So these are our cross-cutting themes. So yeah, uh, gender, research, media, innovation, uh, policy, and, uh, and advocacy. Uh, under gender, uh, we recognize that uh, positive youth development cannot be achieved in Africa. 
uh, without gender equality. Uh, in research, we are committed to leveraging research into everything we do in order to generate evidence for use, and especially in advocating for change. So under media, uh, we leverage on the media to encourage uh, participatory democracy and to strengthen accessibility of information. Uh, through information, through innovation, we focus on innovative models that achieve scale, uh, quality, and improved performance for our areas of work. And uh, through policy and advocacy, we contribute to lasting change that is only possible when new programs, uh, innovations, knowledge, and research results are, are translated into policies. So this is our mission, which states that to enrich uh, the lives of young people by modeling and advancing youth-led and rights-based approaches to foster uh, young people's civic efficacy, uh, community resilience, sustainable development, and equip equitable society, as well as proposing innovative solutions, driving social progress, and inspiring transformative change by utilizing innovative research policy and advocacy action. And our vision is to advance youth-led approaches toward achieving sustainable development, social equity, innovative solutions, a community resilience, and transformative change. So I also want to introduce uh, the partners that uh, we partner with, especially for the, for bringing in this uh, webinar, and for the uh, Ignite African Youth Project that is already ongoing. So we partner with the uh, European Partnership for Democracy and the Youth Democracy Cohort. The European Partnership for Democracy is a non-profit organization uh, that is supporting democracy and good governance around the world. And the uh, Youth Political and Civic Engagement Cohort, also known as the Youth Democracy Cohort, is one of the platforms that was launched as part of the Year of Action of the 2021 Summit for Democracy. So the cohort brings together government, civil society, organizations, the private sector to advance good governance and democratic renewal around the world. The Youth Democracy Cohort of the Summit for Democracy is an inclusive platform to take meaningful action towards implementing Summit for Democracy commitments on youth, political and civic engagement through resources, expertise, research activities and achievements. Yeah, so that's basically the introduction of the Youth Cafe and uh, the partners that we work with. Uh, back to you, Esther. So uh, thank you so much, Moses. So um, that, that was about the Youth Cafe. And uh, this webinar is... Um, part of the Ignite African Youth Project that is brought to you by the Youth Cafe in partnership with the Youth Democratic Cohort as he has introduced it, um, and of course, uh, European Partnership. And we'll get also a brief of that from our colleague, Oliver, who is also our moderator for this session. Mm, hello, everyone, and good morning uh, from our side here in Kenya. I'm uh, really excited uh, to be here this morning and we'd like to welcome everyone and for joining us for this meaningful engagement. And as you heard, I, I respond to the name Sheila Oliver, uh, where I coordinate programs here at the U Cafe, where, but indeed I like to say uh, not an expert, but very knowledgeable in matters of youth affairs. So I would like to, in a nutshell, to take you through what led to this engagement uh, today. Uh, that is the United African Youth, Pro Youth Project, as well as uh, the webinar event for today. So like you heard, Youth Cafe is part of the Youth Democracy Court, uh, which the Youth Democracy Court is, uh, is the Summit for, for Democracy, is a global and inclusive platform uh, to make meaningful action towards implementing a uh, Summit for Democratic Commitments on youth political and civic engagement uh, through resources, expertise, uh, research, activities and achievements. So the Ignite Africa New Project uh, is supported by the Democratic Court and also inspired by the European Union. Uh, so what led to this project uh, indeed that is the, the, the Youth Cafe is a beneficiary of the subgrant from the Youth Democratic Court. And based on our analysis and research, I identified challenges that are uh, based 
um, as young people from Africa had uh, issues like uh, lack of institutional capacity, which undermines youth engagement in African democracies, that is from low visibility as youth voters, limited capacity uh, for youth-led advocacy, cultural attitudes under representation or exclusion in decision making, a loss or trust of democracy, online disinformation uh, or any misinformation, among others, which often mis uh, hinder the participation of young people in democratic process. So the Ignite African Youth Project aims to increase uh, youth engagement, especially for young women from Africa in active and meaningful roles in democratic processes. Uh, that is due to strengthen and enhance political and civic capacities. So additionally, we also, uh, we also look, uh, this project seeks to localize, uh, uh, promote, support, and monitor the adoption of the Summit for Democracy Money of Portable Commitments, which I can probably say that it was the first compilation of best practices on inclusive youth participation in democratic processes globally, uh, where the Youth Cafe was part of. <clears throat> so the project ideally will target youth from sub-Saharan African countries, that is Zambia, uh, Kenya, Central African Republic, and Ghana, uh, with an increased emphasis on our young men. Well, this was based on a cost cutting uh, issues, uh, civic and democratic challenges uh, that the youth face in the different country contexts in its wells. So, the Ignite African Youth Project uh, objectives and outcome will achieve through the following components that word, uh, that is assessment of the de current democratic situation uh, through capacity building, uh, communication co campaigns, coaching and mentorship, uh, advocacy and engagements. Uh, also, the project will be a one year project that will run from um, uh, that has already begun, that is from July 2023 to uh, June 2024. So as part of uh, part the components to achieve the, our goal and objectives and advocacy and engagement, this was whereby the project has led to support uh, youth-led advocacy actions as uh, yeah, key as the event of today uh, in, in around KSG such as the International uh, Youth Day. So <clears throat> this led to the events uh, that today uh, that we are here today as young people. We are, we are going to uh, introduce uh, the, the, the event for today. We are going thereby to uh, redefine the future of democratic processes uh, in Africa uh, based on the presented agenda for the day events. So first and foremost, I like to say that in advance and have an international day uh, to all of you uh, in that uh, it is also event for today is in, in line uh, with the International Youth Day for 2023 whereby we aim to, uh, through empowering youth skills in shaping policies, as well as initiatives related to sustainability and environmental protection. So the objective and, uh, and the dynamic inclusive of uh, this event, we seek to empower uh, the African youth, especially the young women to actively participate and take, uh, uh, and take on meaningful roles in shaping their democracy. Also recognizing the immense potential and untapped talent for our youth population. So in our discussions today, I will focus on the importance of educating and empowering young people about their rights and responsibilities as citizens, as well as increase youth engagement in active and meaningful roles in the democratic processes. Also for our event today, this will be a platform for young people to discuss their perspectives of the current and democratic processes in Africa, to share their innovative ideas on how to rebudget and redefine the future of democratic processes in Africa, and also to make sure that they're inclusive, fair, and transparent. So also uh, this platform is to bring together our young people, policymakers, uh, stakeholders to foster collaboration and create opportunities uh, for the youth to take leadership roles and participating in shaping the democratic uh, processes in Africa. Uh, also, uh, we aim to localize and promote and support as well as help understand the perspective and adoption and implementation of the many possible commitments in an African perspective. Like I said, we are having that the Youth Cafe uh, was probably to take part in the first compilation of this menu for uh, possible commitments. So in a nutshell, uh, that what uh, has led to this uh, beautiful engagement today. And I believe that uh, the, the, the discussions will be able to achieve, uh, to achieve our, our objectives and outcomes for this, uh, for this uh, event. So let's keep the conversation going on our socials. And let me take back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Oliver. So uh, we have a knowledge on how uh, we came uh, by to have this webinar. So right now we'll go to uh, 
receive a keynote speech from uh, uh, one of our advisory board members who is Nzilani Muema. And uh, I welcome you Nzilani to uh, you know, give us the keynote address as we even enter into this discussion. Welcome. Thank you so much, Esther. You're doing a wonderful job moderating the session. I'll go straight into the keynote speech. Good day. I'm delighted to give an address at this webinar. Young people redefining the future of democratic processes in Africa. Part of the broader project, the Ignite African Youth Project. As we commemorate International Youth Day 2023, under the theme, Green Skills for Youth Towards a Sustainable World, it is essential that we focus on empowering young people with the skills essential to drive sustainability initiatives at local as well as global levels. The Ignite Afri African Youth Project reflects our willingness to encourage young people to be change agents in society by fostering their engagement and participation in democratic processes. Youth engagement and empowerment, especially for young women in Africa, is a vital step towards achieving a sustainable future. We must recognize that young people constitute a significant proportion of the African population, and their voice matters in shaping policies and initiatives related to sustainability and environmental protection. They bring new ideas, diverse perspectives, and creativity that can contribute to the sustainable transformation of our continent, Africa. The truth is that young people are critical stakeholders that cannot be ignored in democratic processes. It's paramount, therefore, that they have the space and opportunity to participate in public decision-making processes. However, for this approach to be effective, it's crucial to break down the barriers that hinder youth's meaningful participation, such as lack of access to information and resources, age restrictions, and cultural biases. The democratic processes in Africa heavily impact young people, young people's ability to create a sustainable, future for the continent, and that is why youth engagement and empowerment is crucial. The Ignite Africa Youth Project reflects the determination to encourage young Africans, especially young women, to, became, to become change agents in society by fostering the engagement and participation in democratic processes. Africa's population largely comprises young people and their participation in democratic processes cannot be ignored. We need to break down the barriers that hinder young people's meaningful participation, such as lack of access to information resources, age restrictions, and cultural biases. To achieve a sustainable future, it is essential to adapt and implement the menu of possible commitments in Africa. This menu will assist in implementing democratic principles that promote democratic governance, respect for human rights, and civic engagement. We must therefore work together to empower the younger generations with the essential knowledge and skills that enable them to participate in democratic processes. Educating them on the importance of democratic processes and their rights and responsibilities as citizens is a critical first step. We must support their political involvement by creating spaces for them to initiate dialogue and engage with policymakers. In conclusion, we must make a concerted effort to empower young people to engage in democratic processes. Their participation in public decision-making processes is, cr is critical to future and sustainable development in Africa. We must create an enabling environment for young people, especially our young women. To exercise this democratic right and influence the future of the continent. Once again, 
I thank you all for the opportunity to address this vital topic of youth engagement in shaping the future of democratic processes in Africa. Thank you, over to you, Esther. Thank you, that is really um, uh, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Let me see, um, I am maybe thumbs up or claps in the room. Great, some thumbs up for that uh, powerful speech. Thank you so much, and Zilani, for that powerful speech about youth engagement and participation in democratic processes, especially young women. I hope we can take action on that. Thank you so much. And we're going to hear more from uh, the rest of our speakers uh, in the next coming few minutes. So please keep the discussions going in the chat, follow us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and you know using the hashtags that have been shared in the chat. So I welcome our moderator, uh, uh, Oliver, to carry on with the, introduce the speakers and carry on with the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Esther, for the wonderful time to work in with as well, uh, for the insights, uh, especially for the African youth. Uh, and I'm very much to be moderating uh, and excited to be uh, moderating this session in the sense that <clears throat> as young people now, uh, we are more or less not uh, waiting to be given these spaces, but we are indeed taking over and taking ownership uh, for it being led. So I'm very much excited to be leading this session at the heart of this uh, uh, engagement today. Uh, for I'll be moderating the sessions uh, and I hope if you have any questions, you could kindly address them on the chat and part of our team, <clears throat> I will be able to pick them up and be able to address them as well. So today I will, I will like say that uh, to remind you, we're going to have a very meaningful engagement um, for our young people to discuss their perspective on the current state of democratic processes in Africa to share the innovative ideas and how to reimagine and redefine the future of civic and democratic processes in Africa and to make sure that they're inclusive, fair, and transparent. Like I said, now we are owning these spaces and not waiting, uh, waiting for them to be given. So with me, I would like to say that uh, I have a very amazing panelists for this session. And I would like to say that each of our panelists uh, bring a very unique in perspective on the importance of educating and empowering young people about their rights and responsibilities as citizens, as well as increasing youth engagement in active and meaningful roles in democratic processes, while importantly strengthening and enhancing people's political and civic capacities. I know you'll be waiting to hear their names and they have they have to offer for this session. So for our first speaker for today, I have Mr. Daniel Rogo, who's the African coordinator for Democracy Moves. Uh, which is a global consortium for democracy champions uh, and also a youth politician and policy makers, as well as society from across the globe. Uh, he's a dedicated his career promoting democratic values, strengthening civic engagement, and advancing good governance in Africa. So, among us, also, we have uh, very actually delighted and honored to have a young legislator from here in Kenya, uh, Victoria Zila, who's the current and elected young. Assembly member from the Kakamega County in Kenya, uh, also is a uh, is a board of, a director member of uh, Child Protection Trust in Kenya, uh, and also is the founder and chairperson of the board of directors of youth leaders and uh, stakeholders. Uh, with us, we also have uh, our third speaker that will be Vivian Mia. She is from Zimbabwe. Uh, she is a program officer from the Girls Youth and Empowerment Network. Uh, she's also a social scientist and a community development uh, professional. A uh, uh, professional who is passionate about humanitarian and development work, and he voices as, as a, also serves as a voice for young people in shaping the national discourse for vulnerabilities. We have our very own it's Mike, Mr. Mike Tom, who is a partnership manager here at the UKP. He's an experienced communications and development consultant with vast experience uh, in and years working in various positions of responsibility as well as undertaking consultancies where he's consulted for various organizations across the East Africa region, including countries like Somalia, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Zambia, and Malawi. So we'd like to dive in into our first uh, session today with Mr. Daniel Logo. I hope that he's on standby already. Uh, so uh, we'd like to start. 
can you can you hear me? Ah, uh, there we go. You can hear you very much, uh, loud and audible. So, uh, that, so Daniel, I'm... today we, pardon. All right, if I'll... you can hear me. Yeah, they can hear you loud and clear. So, Mr. Daniel is going to uh, take us to the topic of understanding uh, the power of youth engagement. In that, what do you mean? We're going to analyze uh, the impact of youth in involvement in politics and civil society, also on fostering inclusive and responsive democracies. As for me, based on your experience, expertise, also to come and give us uh, real life situations and examples as well, not just the knowledge of a narrative, also to give us these policies on how uh, we're going to understand the power of youth engagement uh, uh, in this region. So, Daniel, can take it away. Thank you, Oliver. I, I I am struggling as technology with these uh, screens and these videos. Um, I don't know whether I'm audible and also visible as well. Um, all right. All right. Um, so thank you. First of all, it's just to uh, wish our participants and ourselves a very, very happy International Youth Day in advance. Uh, it is meant to, to be on 12th, but I think we risk because then the 12th is on, on, on a weekend. So we are not able to converge on a weekend. So I think it's important to wish all of us a very, very happy International Youth Day in advance and uh, recognize the strength that we have made in our different capacities as leaders in our respect. I would also acknowledge that, uh, you know, sometimes analysis, people suffer from analysis paralysis. So I am hoping that I will give justice to, uh, to the topic for today. My name is Daniel Lorogo, and uh, I, I am the coordinator for Democracy Moves in the African region. And uh, first of all, I think uh, the purpose for myself in uh, this particular session is to understand the power of youth engagement and uh, maybe just try to give an analysis of, uh, as a young person, our involvement, the fruits of our involvement in civil societies and in fostering inclusivity and responsive democracies. I'm also going to help us because I also struggle a lot um, just like anyone else, I do struggle to understand whether the current state of democracy favors, favors us or not. In one of the organizations that I belong to, that is Democracy Moves, until yesterday, we are struggling to explain whether is this democracy working for Africa or the things that we really need to divine, uh, you know, to contextualize our democracy. So I, I think I hope that this session is also going to give us, you know, um, a fair assessment to our, our democratic state. And that is understanding the power of youth engagement. And so it is coming on a background, uh, colleagues, where we have seen concerted efforts in the region, but as well as in the continent. Our friends and our brothers from Niger and Nigeria has passed a bill that is called Not Too Young to Run. And this bill is definitely looking at the age reduction that was passed on 2018 and making sure that young people are not restricted with certain age criteria when they are going to run for office. And for example, the bill in Nigeria, you know, uh, lowered the age limits for political office from 35 to 30 years for those young people who are running for Senate. And in 30 to 25 in the House of Representatives, in the House of State of House Assembly, what we call here Senate or National Assembly. We have also seen concerted efforts, colleagues that are piling up, uh, you know, from executives on different countries in Africa. We are live aware currently uh, that in Nigeria, for example, I mean, Senegal, for example, the rise of Osman Sonko that is pushing for a critical space in the presidency that his image would mirror that he is a young person, 
that is trying to push not only for himself, but the space of young people in involvement against autocratic government that would not allow young people to rise into leadership position. Down south, we are seeing the rise of Nelson Chamisa of Zimbabwe. He's trying to cause a space within himself on young people from Zimbabwe, maybe to occupy the seats, the seats of power and to start from presidency to the House of Representatives and all those positions. Nigerians are quite aware from the last election. Peter Obi tried to be an, a new entrant in the political you know, space to try to disrupt the space. That to ensure that young people are critically occupied, though he might not be a young person with the age that we define, but his engagement and his candidature, you know, made sure that there is a promise for Africa, that young people indeed can critically forge their ways into these spaces. Colleagues, and those of us who are gathered here today, I think we have known that there are a number of measures that are being tried to put through to make sure that most young people effectively try to engage in politics and in civil society as well. And then as a people and as constituency of young people in the region and in the continent, how then can we encourage them to take an active role in shaping a political space? Now we understand that our problem as a Kenyan, first of all, our problem in the nation and in the constituency of young people has been trying, first of all, to demystify the issue of politics. While we grew up and while what we are seeing in the media is that politics, the word is a dirty game, that if you try to engage into it, you will not come out of it clean, you will not come out of it alive. And some extreme measures, you will be paralyzed for the whole of your life because politics has been muddied. So first of all, the barrier that we face as a constituency is that our young people have associated politics with very bad things, have associated politics with corruption, has associated politics with violence, and has associated politics with any other bad thing that you can imagine. And I can imagine as for women, the issue of politics and the terrain that has been there, not only in Kenya and also in many of the other regions that we see. So the barrier, first of all, that we have seen that has made us here is that we see politics as that, but not from a point of leadership and not from the point of service. The other barrier that we've also seen, um, you know, um, that we've seen is, I think even growing up, uh, most of us who, in Kenya, I think we are now struggling with whether we have a curriculum-based competency curriculum. But for those of us who went through, uh, you know, 844, there had been an attempt for us, even as we learn from early primary school, to understand what is called a nation. You know, what is called the nationality of being a Kenyan. Most of us can remember you are learning about, you know, uh, you know the emblem, you know, uh, to recite some of these, even the national anthem, to recite some of these, you know, uh, national things as early as that. But you see for us is one of the things we are seeing right now is that there is a difficulty in us from early age of identifying with the nation, of identifying with early socialization into leadership and political service. So I think it's for us, it's important. You know, um, it's important for us to, to, to discuss and see if possible, uh, we begin to sharpen our knowledge and lack of information as my colleague has talked about, that we come to confront ourselves with politics, you know, at an advanced stage where we are already confronted with a number of issues that politics and leadership and public service is, something that is you know uh, subjective you know, and something that is, is is another option so i think the most effective ways for us is just to look at this early socialization institutions you know community service revise our school curriculum curriculums begin to think debating clubs how then would we nurture an objective debaters that can proceed you know to be debaters in the national assemblies in the house of representatives 
to be the debaters of policies, shapers of destinies of a country. You know, those are the things that I foresee. So the other thing that I've also seen is the need. Let us also try to see as continuous because we are into a system where civic education and voter education has been relegated, you know, um, to the time when people want to go for an election. So I think it's important for us to begin to look how then would we encourage parliament, representatives, people to ascend into this position, you know, and, and, and even to coalesce around, you know, uh, matters that are most important, even to the region. For us in civil society, I think for us even to extend and express institutional behaviors, you know, carry forward with rights for demonstration and protest and community gatherings and writing petitions and accountability services, you know, measures to draw accountability. Um, for me, you know, is also to try to look at this specific, you know, uh, like I've said, uh, the barriers that has made us, uh, you know, as a youth. My colleagues mentioned about, you know, um, age restrictions, you know, gender, you know, matters of uh, gender restrictions as well. Finding it difficult for women, you know, for example, to go into the terrain of politics and character assassination for young women, especially. You want to vie, you'll be asked, who are you married to? Where are you coming from? You know, um, and in some of these are political classes, you know, women have even asked to, con you know, to confirm that in this position, sometimes they have to be accompanied by men in the political podiums to say, here I am, you know, this is my family. Some things that people, men are not being asked to on the other end. So I think it is important for us to look at into those restrictions, age, you know, gender restrictions, uh, you know, barriers that are cultural context that exclude young people as well in decision-making. You've had some, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, issues being said that, you know, you are leaders of tomorrow, not today. For young people, you're always that tomorrow, uh, that you are not prepared, uh, the leadership that never comes. So the other gap that I also foresee is, you know, uh, the lack of mentorship. I mean, we have young people who've gone into the positions of leadership and who want to run. But the question is, you know, who, who mentors who mentors these young people? You know, running for office into public service in civil society is not, a, is not a bad thing, but who gives the direction? Who do we look up to, you know, in these positions? Um, are there someone who holds our hands? So I think it's important for us to look into. Issues of economic barrier. Westminster Foundation for Democracy published a report, you know, that was looking at the cost for running for office. And it is, it is for young people, it is way above. It is, it, is, it is a cost that you cannot just manage. And I think that is an equal. When it comes to, you know, all the people who are well-established and those who are incumbents, youth cannot compete with these people who are already established because of the financial muscles, because of the experiences, because of the, of the monies that dictates the political space. So, you know, um, and also what I've said is just a bad understanding about, about, about leadership versus service. You know, I've said politics versus leadership. And one of the things is also what our media needs to help us, what sells. It is quite difficult, uh, for example, to, you know, to ask the media, you know, to spotlight uh, young people who are running. Uh, last election, we were privileged to be spotlighted, you know, here in Kenya for young people who had been touted to vie. The nation ran a good publication of you, young people from Demo who want to run in presidency to the Senate. But I think it was after sustained push from, you know, youth organizations that the media dedicates first three pages of the newspaper to look to highlight young people who want to run a complete departure from media and you know, well-established politicians and coalitions. So I think it's important for young people also to look into, try to begin to have a conversation with the media because there needs to be a fair coverage processes. Just as they give it to the all, they also need to give it to young people as well. So I think those are partly what, what, what um, um, uh, uh, what, what, what I can say is that is important for us to begin to look at. And then how can young people also, you know, um, 
young people are not homogeneous. This is one thing that I understand, Oliver, and, and our participants. Uh, while we try to think that young people are, you know, the youth in, in Lusaka are equally, you know, similar to the youth from, you know, rural parts of Zambia, or the youths, you know, um, uh, from, uh, from Lilongwe are equally, you know, uh, you know, having the same demographics from the youth from Blantyre or the youth from, you know, um, Lagos and equally having the youth from, uh, you know, um, you know, Northern parts of Nigeria or Southern parts of Nigeria. And at the same to Nairobi as rural, but I think they're not homogeneous. Uh, the youth in the city, probably because of the nature of exposure have got an advantage. So it is important also to look at then how then would we ensure that the youth not being homogeneous as we actually think they are, are not. And so how then would we look at how they're capable to participate fully? So this goes to the what I mentioned before. Can governments actually look, for example, into the issues of you know, uh, you know, young people's policy measures, both in the urban and the rural areas? The institutionalization of national youth councils, you know, can it be devolved just like the way we have other measures? You know, other institutions devolve. You know, the bodies, for example, uh, you know, um, electoral bodies, IEBC, INEC, and all these institutions. Can we have continuous civic education uh, that is equally run in cities and in rural areas for young people? You know, um, organizations that normally learn leadership and mentorship programs, you know, PLGP, youth elect you know, um, uh, the politics of young people in politics with value in Nigeria, can, can they begin also to be equal in the in their, in their selection for young people who are participating in these, uh, you know, particular processes? So for me, I see it as a potential and as I wind up in this conversation is then technology, because I've all asked then what is, we have an advantage of technology for youth. This technology has enabled us to create spaces for ourselves. We have technology that has enabled us to collect our stories and to publish them without necessarily get, getting you know, monies to the media and the cost of running publications in the media, the cost of running campaigns, the cost of running our programs. Can we um, you know, um, look at how then would we use technology, the rise of citizen journalism to tell our stories you know, just not a way to be aired in the mainstream medias. Uh, you know, the rise of mobile telephone, you know, penetration, internet access, which I understand sometimes is, is, is more concentrated in, in urban compared, but looking at the mobile phone penetration, I think it could be important for us to look at then how would we, you know, leverage through these technologies, you know, mobile phone, telephone uh, technologies and applications that amplify our voices. Um, and in future, we need also to push electoral management bodies, uh, you know, for example, um, that can we have elections being done at the comfort of our, you know, sitting rooms and comfort of our bedrooms and comforts of our areas and our playstations so that we can vote as opposed to lining up, waking up, that we can easily as young people vote so that we deal with you know um, you know the the bad issues that always comes when we line up, and the violence that we see in the polling stations, in violence that we see into civic spaces, that can be dealt with when we enhance our technology. But we also understand that this technology has got a baggage on itself. The downside of it, the rise of mal, you know uh, malwares and ransomwares and cyber crimes and 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 tracking and harvesting of this information, that we understand the fake news, misinformation and disinformation. So that, you know, always marks any electoral period. So I think for us as, 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 as a constituency, it's important that we begin to fast track, you know, um, some of these um, uh, measures that would help us participate meaningfully in public service, in leadership, in civil society. And as I conclude, then what is my conclusion? My conclusion is that it's, it's more important to have a conversation about the new trend. Like I've said, this variant, the new variant, I call it the new variant in democracy that is rising in Africa, that has shown a number of young people dissatisfied 
that the process of elections do not yield to the outcome and the expected result of election. I am tempted to think and say here without shame that democracy is working, except that the constituencies of young people and electorates are tired with people who try to, you know, to, to interfere with democracy. Young people believe in democracy, but young people do not believe on those who want to interfere with democracy. So I think it is important to separate that, that we are not dissatisfied with the democracy. What we are dissatisfied with is people who would want to use and interfere with democracy and meddle and recreate democracy to fit their own. And lastly, is that the youth should only be prepared for the future, that they have a role to play today in making decisions that affect the future of the continent. With that, I think, Oliver, I say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. I think the nostalgia, nostalgia of that presentation, Daniel, I think you should give him a round of applause, a thumbs up for the actually the presentation well done. I uh, can take her uh, from your presentation, I can tell indeed. Um, uh, if you have any questions uh, uh, directed to Daniel based on understanding the power of youth engagement, you can kindly direct them on the chat and our teams will be able to pick them up. And also you can state your name and the country you're coming from, this understanding a different context. I can say that indeed, thanks again very much, Daniel, uh, for uh, for that meaningful presentation and speak, I can, I can mention some few takeaways uh, in that, uh, for example, for the current uh, forms of democracy, indeed, uh, we, have to, we have to ask, uh, to ask ourselves that um, and they favor us as, as young people. Also, we would like to share more information about uh, the, the bill that was passed on not, not too young uh, to run, that is on the West Africa issues. Also, you've touched on the innovative ideas whereby young people can engage in democratic policies. Also, I would like to point out uh, the association of politics with young people, that is the to survive versus the leadership. As well, also, we should take it upon ourselves, so not only not to nurture, who will not to nurture ourselves, but also promote peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentorship, among others, also to mention on the gaps. Uh, that you will take, I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, our job well done. Uh, and I can uh, thank my colleague here. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking forward to the day that <laughs> we'll be able to vote from uh, PlayStations at our home, but during the current situation, uh, we really appreciate you for your presentation. I think Estaka would like to mention a question directed to you, uh, Daniel Gomosho. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Daniel, and I love the engagement in the in the chat. Box Clary says the youth have to take up the leadership mantle and not wait for it to be given. Yeah, that is very true. Um, so there is a question from Franklin Yatemo. She he is asking, how do we hold accountable the young people in leadership? I know uh, a few have been mentioned, and uh, this question may also be you know answered by our next speakers. But um, I think uh, Daniel can be able to just you know uh, do a short uh, on that. How do we hold accountable the young people in leadership? Thank you, back to. Well, 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 well. I one one of the uh, it's quite a very difficult but also a challenging question. Like I've said, um, we young people in leadership, leaders do not come from space and do not come from other planets. These leaders comes from among us ourselves. You can attest that in your cycle, maybe you have known someone who's raised into the position of member of county assembly or any house of representative. You know them, we know them. They have been in our cycles. And we interacted with them and they displayed, you know, some semblance of responsibility and qualifications, and therefore we voted them. We as a people, um, the legal provisions and the constitution provides us le leeway. First is to make sure that we tell them, and they should know very clearly that they are there as people representatives. And we all could not go to parliament. We all could not go to senates. 
and county assemblies or whatever house of representatives. So we chose people. In effect, we were, all of us were supposed to be in these houses, but democracy demands that we are represented. So they should know, first of all, be reminded that they are there to represent the interest. And therefore, if we want to hold them to account, we have various ways of holding them to account. We have ways of calling them. And I've seen people engaging their members of parliament by either phone calling them, by either you know, engaging them virtually, or by either just you know, um, calling them out with their names of where they are not delivering of their services. And thank you very much. But is also to make sure that we, we remind them that election comes and election go. That if they do not yield into what we want, then we have every electoral period, electoral cycle to, you know, to, to recall them back home. And uh, our constitution also give us the powers to recall, which is very difficult. But it's important that we have measures of recalling people back to service. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel, for that insight and response uh, that was raised out. I can see that people are raising up uh, their hands from, uh, from our side. I can say, kindly due to time, you can kindly address your question uh, to the chat box and be able to address them. And also, I think uh, Daniel may be able to share his contacts. You can directly contact him to the chat if you made the other, other inquiries about it. And I very much like the trajectory that uh, uh, this, uh, this conversation is taking, that you are. Uh, guys are not giving us only that the theory aspect of it, but also the real uh, aspect situations uh, like that are happening on the ground in the different contexts uh, within our country. So uh, with no further ado, we'd like us to move to the next session. We have, I'm going, I've already introduced our, our second speaker, uh, whereby I'm very much excited about this session, which we consider to be the core, the core heart of this uh, uh, webinar today. I can say that indeed uh, among us, we have uh, Victoria Zillow. I can say she's an, an elected actually, young lady himself. And I can say uh, uh, from our side that uh, I think I'm safe to say that she dared to challenge. And she will be speaking on uh, overcoming barriers at participation, that is identifying and addressing the challenges faced by young Africans, particularly our young women, in accessing and engaging in political and civic forces. So you'll be able to share maybe uh, the tactics and innovative ideas and how he got to where he got. She to where she got sorry also the innovative ideas and uh, his success stories and how he can overcome these uh, barriers to participation. For example, also what skills uh, or qualities do you think are essential for young Africans as leaders to become successful leaders in political and civil societies? So uh, for yeah in Kenya you call them wesh. So with Victoria Zilla uh, session is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, just as my previous, the previous speaker has stated, I'd also wish to acknowledge young people in this space today as we toast and celebrate to International Youth Day. It is a very important day for us to just come back uh, to reflect and see how best we can keep on building ourselves moving forward. Thank you so much, Youth uh, Cafe for this opportunity. As you had already introduced me, I'm Honorable Victoria Zilla. I'm a special elect member, County Assembly of Kakamega. Now, on uh, how we can uh, overcome barriers to participation and uh, more specific to young women. First, uh, uh, I wish to build up on uh, what the previous speaker has stated. He's been very detailed and elaborate. He's alighted most of the challenges young people are facing, which still affects young women in participation uh, in political spaces. And um, just on the same, it is very interesting, even as we look at our own, uh, our own space here in Kenya and how women have been uh, engaged in politics. First, I come from Western Kenya. I think this is a very highly patriarchal society whereby I don't think uh, in the past uh, three elections, we have even one single elect member of parliament from Western region, from Kakamega. Western, that is Luya Nation at large. 
uh, if you look at our county assembly, we have 60 elected MCS, whereby only two, only three are women. The rest are all men. So you can see we have a long way to go as young people and as young women engaging in this space. So there are very many challenges, but uh, just uh, uh, now that uh, Daniel has already mentioned most of them, uh, there's the issue of having a, us existing in a patriarchal society, though we are changing as information comes, as people are more informed, they are able to embrace women in political spaces, though the ground is not yet level. We also have the challenge of resources. Uh, many of young people would wish to participate in political processes, but campaigns have become very expensive. It has become very expensive and there are very few of us who have built enough financial muscles to be able to elbow out those people who are out there already in this space to participate in politics. We also have uh, the issue of cultural norms. Uh, our society has, has in a way entrusted the elderly as gatekeepers in leadership space. They are being trusted to have experience and wisdom. And so a young people selling their agenda is still a very big challenge, something that we need to come out from. There's also the issue of patronage networks. In our political spaces, you realize, even when you are forming political alignments across the board, those who call the shot, they have their own network. They have people who they want to associate with. So a young people breaking into that space is difficult because who are you? Where do you come from? Your family name, it becomes a serious issue. So the networks in the political space have high patronage and it is a challenge for young people to break through that space and enjoy. You become, you are really questioned a lot based on your background or your association, your history, but we are glad that dynamic uh, is changing slowly with time. And then uh, now oh, we also have the component of not just a young politician getting into political spaces, but also the issues of voter. How well is our voter informed? Because uh, you look at Kenya, for instance, uh, the, youth, the youth from three quarters of the population is youth. So we can literally rally young people in all leadership spaces. But now go back into statistics of those who have been registered as voters. We are at 39% only. When you look at statistics of our previous elections, there is high voter apathy. If you look at the data, it is the youth who are, are not showing up to vote. There is high voter apathy. So I believe uh, those are some of the gaps uh, just uh, together with what uh, the previous speaker has highlighted. So on uh, now, how do we overcome that barrier? I would wish to give uh, an example, but before I go into that, Young people, we acknowledge the times, the times are changing. We are in a digital space, digital world. And it has been, a, it has created so many platforms for young people to express themselves. Uh, an example is, um, you look at the revolution led by, by Salah in, uh, in Sudan, Allah Salah. That's a, a very good example, I think, for for young women. In Sudan, a 22-year-old woman was able to lead a revolution to, that led to the hosting out of uh, al-Bashir, the president. But how did she get there? At 22-year-old, she was facing the same barriers that we've highlighted. But thanks to technology, she used uh, social media. It was an anchoring point. She used it to rally young people, uh, uh, everybody across the country to rally towards that cause. Uh, the protests she organized and uh, how she was expressing herself, it was highly 
relying on social media. And you can see the results. At the end of the day, a 22-year-old was able to oust out a president, a sitting president. And, and, and what was she addressing? Her country was uh, only having 25% representation of women in parliament. Her country was having a cabinet that no woman was part of. It was purely a gentleman's affair. And there was need for someone to rise and break that cycle so that women can be, be involved in uh, the political processes. So social media played a critical role. Uh, same to Barack Obama campaign, it was heavily, it heavily relied on social media. And that is how we got a, an African, someone with African roots, a black, to lead one of the powerful states in the world. So social media plays a critical role. As young people, we need to look at how do we leverage on technology to, and, and media and social media to just uh, be able to, to rally people uh, alongside our call so that we can be able to make, make it. Uh, you look like a, 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 another example is, uh, though it is after post-election, we have Peter Salasia. This is someone I was sitting in his main campaign team and we pushed for his campaign. But you look at today how he's, uh, he's built himself uh, a very powerful brand in social media. He can easily use it to champion any cause he wants because of technology and media. So we need to exploit, that is one space we can exploit as young people. Another example, another, another thing we can look at into addressing this challenge, we need to revisit uh, our laws around elections. What are political parties? What are the thresholds set by political parties to allow young people to participate in these spaces? You know, you find a, a young person want to, wants to vie for a gubernatorial seat, paying a half a million to a million. That is a threshold the party has placed so that they can be cleared to rally for this seat. So there is need for us to relook and advocate for having fair policies and legal frameworks that supports young people to be able to to take advantage and go for this political position. When we re look at that, we'll be able to give a fair, equal opportunity to everyone, those who have limited resources, not to be left out in that journey. Another, another issue, so we can influence this at political party level, like me being a youth leader of Democratic Action Party of Kenya, it is my business to ensure that my party reviews its constitution and ensure that we are not, we are not uh, restricting young people to go for political position because of the, the amount we are, we are requesting from, from them so that they can be cleared as candidates. But you can also look at the laws of Kenya and how it can be able to address that issue as well. And then, um, Yes. Uh, another another issue is uh, how do we create uh, engage young people to to be able to to establish themselves uh, economically? How do we create? How can we create opportunities for young people so that they can be able to to earn a living at the end of the day, to get resources, so that they can be able to prepare for a political campaign? Because either way, even if we review the rates at political parties and review our policies. At the end of the day, we'll still need some resources to push up your campaign. So even for me at the county level, we are looking at how do we come up with a policy that will be able to strengthen and support young people to exploit their skills, to develop cottage industry so that they can be able to venture into business. And as a front end, they can be able to to earn a living and make resources and be able to, to have a starting point whereby they can be able to facilitate their own logistics, push their agenda. Even on social media, there's a fee that is being required if you want to do a campaign to reach how many people 
you still need some few resources here and there. So those are some of the issues we can be able to do to just support women. Another thing we need to really be vibrant and advocate for uh, the issues of patriarchy. I think this is just because of misinformation. We've been able to limit women to participate into politics. So we need to create more awareness, enlighten more people that whether it's a woman or a man, we are all capable to lead. And we have success stories of people who've been able to transform their society because they were interested in leadership position. And then uh, lastly, we need to look at the media. I think the media has been very biased. When you see a woman running for a political space, uh, vis a vis the men. You see, the men are getting high media highlights. They are being featured in this news, mainstream media, what they are doing, where they were. But women, media has been shunning away from young women, giving them a space so that they can be able to also highlight their stories, share their, 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 their vision so that they can get buy in from the voters. So I think. Uh, the media needs to change how it works. It needs to not to be biased, but now create more spaces, more, more high, do more highlights featuring young women, young youth in those spaces. I think when we are getting that media coverage, it is also a way of supporting young people in these political processes so that many can be reached to. You can easily convert people to buy into your vision and your agenda and get that support without having a one-on-one -on -one engagement. Media plays a very critical role and they need to commit towards that. And I believe when that happens, we'll be moving in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, for a very insightful session. Uh, indeed, I can say that you've done justice uh, to that particular session in addressing and identifying uh, the challenges faced by our young women in actually accessing in these political and uh, civic processes. So some few takeaways from the presentation, like I said uh, earlier, indeed, you dare to challenge and to get uh, to become an elected leader. As a, as a young woman from Africa. So you mentioned on the need to embrace uh, women in political uh, spaces, also issues of lack of resources uh, among it, being that in the young women, also the patronage uh, networks, uh, cultural norms within themselves, and also uh, the insights of dynamics within uh, our, 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 our populace. So the aspect was of border Africa like that you mentioned it. Also, is it in that when you talk about whether is it that our young women or youth in Africa, is it that they are, they are not interested in matters of leadership and politics or democratic processes, or is it that they don't have the information? I am very much uh, uh, thankful that you mentioned the aspects of uh, mis and information. Also, I think we now, as young people, we should also leverage uh, our technology and media. Also, I can, I can say acknowledge that the aspect of AI, which has come uh, into into these spaces also. I think thank you for identifying how we can address these challenges uh, through the platforms that we have been provided and also uh, for the conversation ahead. And also I think it's now for ourselves also to increase uh, not only the media courage, but also social media courage uh, of our young women uh, in Africa as well. So I would like to thank you for uh, that insightful session. And thank you very much. Uh, I would like also to welcome questions uh, that you may have to direct them to the chat uh, for Victoria and you may be able to address them as well or maybe uh, contact them directly. So I really like, the, uh, like I said again, again you know, uh, it is not theory and the examples that our speakers are giving are really what is affecting our young people uh, in, the multi in, in the spaces that they're operating in Africa in civic and democratic spaces. So I thank you for guys giving me time. Uh, with no further ado, I would like to move to our next speaker for the session. So we have had uh, uh, our perspective for an elected leader uh, from here in Africa on how we're able to overcome those uh, barriers. Like I said, this story, this particular issue is at the cohort of this event today. So we also have Ms. Uh, Vivian Mia. Yeah? She is from Zimbabwe, I can say that, uh, from and the organization uh, uh, Wentrust. And she'll also be speaking. Uh, 
to be speaking on overcoming uh, this uh, these barriers and participation from her perspective, from my region's perspective, in identifying and addressing the challenges faced by the young women in Africa, uh, also particularly for young women, also uh, in accessing and engaging political and civic processes. So, uh, Vivian, Karibu Sana, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? I can very much hear you. We can be can talk audibly now. Can be able to go you now. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Vivian Mina, and I'm from Zimbabwe, and it has already been stated. I'm really grateful to the Youth Cafe for giving us this platform and opportunity. And it really comes at a critical time as uh, here in Zimbabwe, we are heading towards a harmonized presidential election in on the 23rd of this month. So I'm really not going to dwell much on the barriers that young people or young women are facing in engaging in politics because it already been said by previous speakers. I'm just going to land down what I have, what we are facing as Zimbabwean women, what we are facing as women in Southern Africa, which I'm sure is what everyone is facing. So we have these social cultural systems where our, our bond of politics is so male dominated that it undermines the value of women's contributions and participation. And really the environment is not conducive for women and young people to participate as it is dominated by violence. And then we have this lack of skill and political experience by women and young people where we don't have the skill to participate. And then lack of information like it has already been said, lack of party and family support, the issue of unpaid care and domestic work for women, where now we are saying that women have other duties and responsibilities at home that hinder them from participating. We also have this economic hardship, financial resources, like limited access to financial resources. I will tell you of an example here in Zimbabwe where we have um, to be nominated to be a presidential candidate you have to pay 20,000 US dollars. And to be nominated to be a member of parliament, you have to pay 1,000 US dollars. And for women, women know that they actually, uh, they do not have the financial capacity to do so, it then becomes a problem. Uh, there's one candidate here in Zimbabwe, she's a female, a young female, she wanted to, she wants to participate, she's already campaigning for the presidential election, but she struggled to raise this $20,000. So I'm not really going to draw much, like I said, on the barriers that young women are facing, but rather on what we can do to actually, what we can do to address these barriers. So maybe we can start by amending the constitutions and electoral laws, right? In this case, maybe the electoral fees. Why not eliminate these electoral fees for young people and for women? Let's be inclusive and so deliberate to ensure that we have uh, seats that are reserved for young people. We have seats that are reserved for young women. I'll tell you of this quota system that is here in Zimbabwe, where we have out of the 120 seats in 210 seats that are there in parliament, 60 are reserved for women, for women and 10 for the youth. Well, the 10 are not enough, but at least it's something that is being done where we just know that we have these senses that are specifically reserved for young people. So it then becomes an issue of, okay, we have these senses, but are these young people actually making or meaningful contributions as they sit on those seats? This is the issue that we really need to discuss. I'm sure there's one participant who asked um, what we can do to hold young people who are in leadership accountable. And then let's equip the young people and the, young, and the women with the necessary skills they need to take up this position. Let's promote political party laws that are gender sensitive. So it finds that our own political party laws, they are not even gender sensitive or youth sensitive. It's just about who is getting the power despite uh, if they is equal youth and women representation. And let's have political finance legislation, like I said, Let's remove nomination fees for women, for young people. And let's have gender equality laws and legislation that addresses violence against women in politics. So I'm just going to move on to 
innovative ideas on how we can re redefine the future of democratic processes. First, let's be deliberate to include young people uh, so that they can be candidates. Also, let's have this youth-led activism and remove these geographical barriers that came with us. I've gotten to understand that um, if young people in Zimbabwe are facing a certain challenge, it doesn't move a young person that is in Cameroon, that is in Nigeria, or that is in Kenya because of these borders that, that have been put ahead of us. But now we have social media, which has no bounds, which has no geographical barriers. Why not? Why not? Like act together and demand reforms in governance as young people uh, in Africa as a continent, not just because we are young people in Zimbabwe and we are facing this challenge and we face it alone. And also let's change the democracy that we want, which is inclusive, which is equitable. And also let's promote intergenerational dialogue between um, the elder generations and the young people. If they are trying to do that, if we promote these dialogues, I'm sure they collaborate, there will be collaboration between between young people and uh, and the elder generations. I'll just give a few examples of young female leaders who have managed to make significant impact in their community. I'll start the one female by the name of who is a Zimbabwean national spokesperson and opposition political party, and she stands for the rights of women and youth in Zimbabwe. She has been arrested for Islam, but continues to speak up in the favor of fellow citizens. In one of the courts to say, women rights are my passion. That is why I did speak up with my church to the intervention of this and marginal life. I'll always be there whenever women rights are violated. I'm also inspired by this young person who is the same from South Africa. Her name is Melinda Katarandole. Uh, the same thing that she actually leads the institution in promoting gender equality. So as, as young people, uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. All right. So, maybe... uh, so, all right. so as young people, as young as women as to say, I believe that we are always going to have barriers ahead of us. The, I'm not sure there's going to be a time where we are going to have level ground, but we just have to sow up those barriers and actually make an effort to participate. Let's say, for instance, before 2010, we were really making great impact towards uh, removing patriarchal barriers that limit women participation, right? Then come 2019, we have COVID-19. COVID-19 reversed all these things, right? Then uh, we are trying to recover from COVID-19. We have climate change impacts on our needs. And you see now that as long as we are seeking to participate, there are always going to be barriers. But it just takes upon you as an individual to say, fine, there are those barriers. Women are being uh, undermined or not participating. What can I do as an individual to ensure that I participate? Uh, then what qualities are essential for young Africans who want to be successful leaders? Let's serve with leadership skills, effective communication and public speaking skills, ability to be accountable and transparent, empathy, being able to influence, critical thinking, confidence. And we can only do that if we actually provide training to young people to ensure that they possess all the skills that I have mentioned. And then what can we do to balance the need for experienced leaders with the desire for new voices? It's simple, let's collaborate. We need the experienced leaders because they have the experience. Again, we need the new voices from young people because their voices is they are the agents of change. So I am glad that the experienced leaders must be accommodating. It's not a fight over power where we are saying, ah, you know what, well, uh, this young person just wants to uh, remove me from power and where the young person is fighting to say, ah, no, your time is up. This is where we need to collaborate to ensure that uh, the is a skills transfer, peer-to-peer transfer. So lastly, I would like to say that the Christian person, um, I'm told he is a grade 12 student who says, young people are often called the leaders of tomorrow. Where is this tomorrow? If it is tomorrow, how many tomorrows? Because we have passed too many, which is true. We are not the leaders of tomorrow. We lead today. And 
And uh, with that, I say happy international day to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian, uh, uh, for that session. I can say that indeed uh, uh, the challenges that are facing our young women uh, from Africa, uh, the various regions that are cost cutting, uh, as mentioned by your previous speaker, I've told you uh, as well. Also, some key takeaway was uh, the economic uh, aspects of it. Um, also, oh, and I'm mining also how we can go to address this in changing uh, but in those are also in aspects of uh, affirmative actions uh, whereby are uh, these young people who are elected uh, to these spaces doing what is indeed needed or maybe in the interest uh, of our young people. So I would like very much to thank uh, our speaker and the uh, and emojis or uh, clubs and thumbs up to them and flowers to uh, our speakers for that particular session. And thank you as well to Vivian, as it is mentioned that we need to promote intergenerational and peer peer collaboration within our seasoned, uh, uh, seasoned and, and also our young persons. I can see from this conversation, uh, we're going to have the next African Union chairperson uh, as a young woman. I know she should not um, fight or push for that. So I would like uh, my colleague. Uh, Esther, to make a comment of you from our chats. I, I, I love the conversation that uh, we're keeping lively on the chats. And also, as a reminder, if you have any, have any questions to a speaker, you can kindly direct them from the chats and be able to prepare for them. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Victoria and uh, Vivian. So I love the conversations in the chat. Keep them coming. I'll just read maybe just one comment or two from Afbo Joseph says that I like to say when it comes to Africa and women in politics, it is worth it to note that we need to address the issues from its root coming back to the you know, school curriculum. That is where we start from, because from that space, women have, have been taught and still are still taught as second class citizens and less human than men folks. And many women have come to accept that. And that is, and that is completely not, uh, and that there is completely nothing, that is completely nothing but a lie that should be addressed and done now than later. Once that is addressed, the media and all the barriers will be forced to follow the tides. That's really an interesting perspective from, um, from Agbo. And um, Dennis also said that, thank you, Daniel, and uh, you know, the, unfortunately, many young women and men are not aware of that. And those who got an opportunity to understand this is a pressing, pressing issues do not have access to free space of action. The other thing is that youth who have ch the chance to go till being elected have to follow rules or orders from their elders in politi on political movement that they belong to. I think Honorable Victoria touched on this. And uh, uh, Dennis, this is one of the reasons why the Youth Cafe has come up, you know, setting up spaces um, so that, uh, you know, the young people can know um, the, the spaces available and, you know, the actions that they can take as some of them are being shared here. So uh, back to you, Oliver. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, comments from our participants and for your engagement for these sessions. Uh, due to time, we'd like us to move to uh, our last uh, topic for this discussion, uh, whereby we'd like to invite uh, uh, our last speaker, but not necessarily our last conversation. And then we're going to keep this uh, momentum of conversation going, even in our socials as well. So I um, would like to, uh, uh, to invite our very own, that is our partnership manager here at the Youth Cafe, Whereby, in, as we were introducing uh, this uh, event today, you had us uh, talk more or less about these many possible commitments. So, um, Mike is going to take us through uh, Leave No African Youth Behind. For well, indeed, uh, the aspect has been Leave, leave No African Behind, but for us, being a youth led organization, we are focused on, uh, on Leaving No African Youth Behind based on the Agenda 2063. So, Mike is going to let us understand the participant perspective, adoption and implementation of these many of possible commitments in an African context. So you take us to what are these many 
body of public officers that we're talking about, how can they be ad 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 adapted maybe to address the unique challenges that are facing our young people in Africa? And also what the role as us as young people can play in advocating for these uh, uh, many of possible communities. So like I, like I said, Mike, uh, floor is yours, take it away. Thank you very much, Oliver and the team. <clears throat> and I want to thank um, the previous speakers uh, for having come through with their uh, reflections and perspectives on the, the various um, um, topics that they have handled. And indeed, when we look at um, the position and the place of the young people in, in Africa and across the world, um, it's good to note that the number of, uh, I mean, in terms of numbers, we have the numbers. Democracy is about numbers. Democracy is about meaningful engagement. And so when we think and look across the continent, we realize that while there is a movement towards um, more and better participation, uh, there are still bottlenecks, there are still people who are left behind, there are still challenges, just like my colleagues have clearly elucidated in their uh, presentations that are holding back, not just young, young women and women in politics, but also um, the general youth. And so today I want to reflect on the menu of uh, possible commitments, but also I just want to begin by uh, looking back slightly and saying, uh, looking at uh, reflecting on who and why uh, some of our youth get left behind. And what would it look like for a comprehensive and inclusive approach that would uh, address some of these challenges and actually give us the opportunity to look at how to meaningfully continue to engage, but also bring out the best of who we are. So to begin on, I just wanted to reiterate what the first speaker um, uh, put out that over 50% of our world is currently under 30 years old. But this huge demographic most of them, actually a good percentage of us are not at the decision-making tables. We do not access the decision-making platforms. While we aspire to be part of the change that we want to see, many of us looking across the continent, you can tell a dissolution a disappointment that is growing uh, among our young people and young leaders. Uh, it is true that we want to be part of the process of bringing change, but quite a number of us, again, have been thrown out by systems that are either patriarchal or cartel-like, what we call them in Kenya, or they have been purposely crafted uh, to leave some people in positions of power and continued power holding. So for us, um, what would be a, a comprehensive and inclusive approach look like? One is thinking around creating an environment where all segments of society and this, particularly for us, the youth populations have equal opportunities to access and also to participate in the democratic processes. That is decision-making that contributes then to uh, the community development. But thinking through this then will require us to recognize the values 
that we ought to ascribe to individual representation that ensures that youths who find themselves in categories of being marginalized, particularly those who've been left behind, then have the opportunity to come through and participate in these processes. Now, allow me to just flag out some of these groups that find themselves marginalized out here. Yes, we have uh, from our previous presenters mentioned particularly young women uh, who are left out. But I would like to also add to these groups, add the rural youth who find themselves in situations where access to resources, access to quality education, access to information is restricted. They have few opportunities to engage in civic activities because of this isolation that they find themselves in. And particularly that this is aggravated by undeveloped structures. Quite a good number of our countries across Africa have pockets of neglect. For example, countries in East Africa, we have countries, we have sections of our countries that are far removed from the main centers where people can access, for example, stable internet uh, penetration, where even the very fact that you want to make a call, you have to go look for a, a, a spot where you can actually access such a service. We have huge swaths of our land that is still undeveloped that then leaves behind many people and the youth in rural areas suffer most. But also another group that is heavily marginalized are the indigenous youth who find themselves, for example, in places where accessing this capacity to participate is almost impossible. For those of us who and know, for example, in Kenya, we have the youths living in uh, the Mao forest, the Ogiek, the, the youths living in sections of Baringo and the northeastern parts. There are youths living in the Virunga mountains. There are youths who find themselves in and around the major forested areas of Central Africa Republic. Some of these young people are denied, do not have the opportunity to participate in civic activities, sometimes due to one language barriers, but also access and undeveloped structures again, keep them out. And then they cannot participate meaningfully. A third group are young people who are able to differently. Now, physical disability, being able to differently, all challenges of mental capacities that then have hindered uh, access due to the situation that people find themselves, then lead to most of these young people encountering physical and, 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 and even attitudinal barriers. They have challenges to come through and fully participate in civic events and, this, and, and, and some of the discussions that are happening. And so they, they, they find themselves almost, not almost, in most cases, they may not be able to access even some of the spaces. And um, a number of our organizations, a number of our political parties do not have reasonable accommodation for youths who may be able to different. We know too that there has been progress in a number of places, for example, here in Kenya and parts of uh, the other countries in East Africa, where youths who have been persons who are uh, able to differently have had the opportunity to be represented, um, positive affirmation that has 
given them these positions, but that does not take care of the majority youth and who are abled differently. Another group that is equally left out and is growing in terms of being marginalized are urban slum dwellers or young people finding themselves in informal settlements. These settlements expose the young people to huge levels of poverty, inadequate infrastructure, and limited access to even the very basic of services. Some of this then hinder the participation of young people in civic activities. That again leads to another layer, that of young people, the unemployed and even underemployed youth. These have very limited time and resources to engage in civic activities because then the very basics of life are not there for them. And so they struggle and economic insecurity can prevent them from active participation and even meaningfully contributing to civic or even democratic processes. I would dare to say some of these young people, particularly those who find themselves in this category of being unemployed or underemployed, the, the ones that are within the informal settlements and the slum dwellers around the urban centers have become targets of politicians who mobilize them at very small costs sometimes to uh, use them for political violence. We have seen this across the, the continent. And this again hinders the young people from fully participating in these processes. Two, two of our, the, the, the previous speakers have actually mentioned the fact that our youths then end up not being fully engaged, a good number of them are not even registered voters. Part of this is of also due to the fact that they do not have um, identification documents. And this then puts them at very precarious situations. This leads me to the next group that is heavily marginalized and also left out in civic engagement processes migrants and refugee youths. Looking at the challenges that we have faced across the continent, a violence and instability that has been brought through by warring parties and crises and small wars that are happening across, they have, faced, they have pushed a lot of our young people into situations of being migrants and refugees. Now, these, of course, face legal and social challenges that cannot allow them to access any meaningful documentation to be able to participate in these processes. There are language barriers. There is also the huge uncertainty that they suffer because of their situations. This does not give them opportunities to actually participate in these processes. The other category are young people who are living with HIV and AIDS, and then that again has pushed them uh, into stigma and discrimination. This has led them to actually exclude themselves or purposely they have been excluded from civic discussions and activities around uh, promotion of democracy and participation in meaningful governance. And finally, I want to mention youths who are also coming from uh, low income backgrounds. When you look at the economic disparities that has been a part of our continent, it has left a lot of young people, even when they go through uh, opportunities of education and qualify, they do not have the capacity to meaningfully engage in civic activities that as many of our presenters have pointed out, require substantial financial resources to be able to participate. And of course, then this leaves a number of them out of the realm of participation. 
we have mentioned conflict, the various conflicts that are the, the theater of conflict that is across this continent is one of the hugest sources of alienating youths from participating. The social disruption that comes, the challenges that come with conflict and the involvement of the young people in this conflict has not given them any opportunity to participate meaningfully in civic engagement. And this is one of those huge things that as young people, we need to start looking at from a different perspective. Conflict and other challenges equally have led to a huge group of young people being orphaned and being pushed to vulnerable situations. Youths who have lost their parents and caregivers do not have the support system to engage effectively in civic activities. And finally, there has, of course, emerged a huge, well, not, well, substantial numbers of youths who have different sexual orientation, the LGBTQ community, who face stigma, who face discrimination. Some of them have been forced into hiding, and the violence that has been meted up, uh, on some of them has not given them the, the opportunity to meaningfully engage again in issues around civic um, uh, participations. Now, what would it take for us to look at a comprehensive inclusion? Why? Do we even talk about a comprehensive inclusion and approaching the menu of commitments that African governments, African organizations, political parties, and the entire governance system needs to pay attention to? One is that for us to look at these groups and the larger youth workforce that is in Africa, we need to meaningfully and purposely target efforts, policies, and initiatives that address these unique challenges that we've pointed out. We need to aim to ensure that all young people regardless of their background or circumstances, have an opportunity to, one, access the information they require, but two, to participate meaningfully in shaping their immediate communities, but also the larger society in which they find themselves. Thirdly, we need to work around the enabling environment where all segments of society including all these diverse youth populations, have equal opportunities to access and the mechanisms to participate in democratic processes. This, of course, includes decision-making, engaging in civic activities that would give them the opportunity and platforms where they can be able to sit and participate, that we will ensure that each of these groups and individual youths have an opportunity to be fully represented and that we promote the active citizenship of each of them for the betterment of our society. Now, um, I would like to point out as I come to a close, the commitments, the menu of commitments that has been prescribed and, and ad adopted by a number of our governments and our organizations that are in governance, some of the pathways that we need to look at is that promotes then meaningful civic engagement. We want to look at accessibility and participation. This would ensure that civic engagement platforms and the opportunity to participate in them is accessible.
to all ages, genders, backgrounds, and abilities. We need to be able to provide multiple avenues for participation, in-person, digital platforms, so that we can accommodate the, diff the different preferences and levels of con connectivity. We know that digitization, like our earlier presenters mentioned, is still in process. We look forward for an opportunity to be able to fully employ the digital technology to be able to enhance the opportunity of young people to participate in civic engagement. We need equally to push and demand for extensive and comprehensive civic education, beginning from our schooling system. That means we need to look at our curriculums. More than 50 years of some of our countries being independent and still relying on colonial education systems that are not responsive to our immediate needs and the needs of our society is, to be honest, a shame that we still want to cling on to colonial systems of education that do not serve us. As citizens of Africa, we need to push for curricula that serves our purposes, that enhances our citizenship, that gives us pride as Africans. And then that also gives us the opportunity to understand not just our rights, but also our responsibilities, and that will push us to look at the functionality of democratic processes. My colleagues have talked around issues of gender equality. I will add around issues of multilingual and multicultural engagements. Our youths are at different levels. We need to promote cultural exchange and respect for different traditions while we foster and share a commitment to democratic values. We also need to push two other elements. The collaborative decision-making processes that foster opportunity for all citizens and particularly the young people who are the majority to be fully involved and represented at government levels and other stakeholder positions that make and implement policy decisions that affect all of us. Well, there are issues much. around accountability and transparency that we all need to be part of so that we are able to monitor governments, government actions, demand transparency and hold our leaders and our elected officials to account to be accountable in their decision making, but also in the implementation of governance processes. Then we need to equally as empowered young people to look at issues of mentorship and capacity building for our young leaders, yes, but for across the board. We need to find ways in which we can empower ourselves through skills and resource mobilization. Our young people coming through the various schooling systems, we need to be able to provide them for opportunities for proper upskilling, communication, advocacy, negotiation, conflict solution to empower our young people to participate. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and I would like to thank you very much, Mike, for that uh, insightful, amazing uh, session. Uh, you know, I uh, would like to take you through for a few take notes from my session. And I think uh, from our speakers, 
then we did take uh, the, the, step, the next step to uh, reimagine, the first step to reimagine and redefine the future of our civic and democratic processes here in Africa. So I would like also, if you want to chat, you can uh, a thumbs up and a clap and a flowers uh, to our speakers and a few. I would like to thank Mike for reminding us if we can do it from your side, kindly. You're not speaking the kind of different side. So thank you, Mike, for reminding us that indeed, as young people, we are not a uh, uh, group. So I would like to pose this question uh, to our parents and our leaders as well. You, like, uh, you can kindly mute yourself from then. Uh, what is I would like to ask these questions to a participant uh, and like uh, to ask yourself uh, in that in what position you as as you learn that you're not a homogeneous group you yourself you as a youth and as self the positions uh, that uh, you put yourself in that is in decision making processes also and civic and democratic processes. Also, thank you, like Mike, for uh, educating on us to create enabling, uh, to deliberate, uh, create this enabling environment uh, for ourselves. And also, uh, I think it's high time on the many possible continuities. As young people, we try as much as possible. How can we use uh, this tool? These are the many possible commitments as a tool to hold uh, governments. Uh, and, and the other stakeholders uh, on their commitments to young people. And also what strategies can we employ as young people to ensure that indeed these governments and stakeholders follow through on these commitments uh, to young people. So once again, I would like to thank our participants for doing justice to these sessions. I know I uh, had much uh, to talk about, but due to time constraints, I also would like to thank your participants as well for your very much engageable uh, uh, comments, questions, uh, as we move on to the next session, which will be led out by my, my colleague. So as I say, this, this is part, is part of, of our broader, broader project, the Unite Africa Bridge project. We are by my colleagues going to share the links on how you can get involved or to be part of our need. This is not going to area, and we look like, forward to engage you guys even further. Like it's a period, the project running from uh, July 2023 to June 2024. So we share links, also our project scope, our brochure, and see how you can also get involved. And also, what we'll be sharing again will be a, a mapping survey and perception survey in regards uh, to the project as well. So I hope. Uh, these sessions have been insightful and indeed that I would like to thank again uh, our esteemed panelists for bringing that, bringing that uh, unique perspectives on the importance and educating and empowering our young people about the rights and responsibilities that they have as well. Also for increasing uh, youth engagement in active uh, as well as meaningful roles in democratic processes. Uh, and also to occupy these political and civic spaces, also provide an innovative way how we can do about it. So as we move on to the next sessions, I would like my colleague uh, to come and uh, point out the three questions that are coming kind of directed to... Yeah, I think Oliver, uh, just before we go to the Q&A uh, section, I, I would like to invite all, all of us to take part in the uh, the poll questions. Yeah, uh, kindly join that interactive platform using the code given below. And uh, please take part in the questions. Thank you. So, uh, my, my colleague, uh, the link will be shared in the chat. You can take part in the poll. If you should get your understanding for this session as well. And as a complete to build capacity among our young people in Africa as well, in civic and democratic processes. So once again, a very heartfelt thank you to our speakers. So we'd like us to move on to the next session. That is the Q&A section. So um, 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your participation. So for this last part, I know time is already gone. I'd just like to take maybe two questions uh, or comments. So if you have any questions for our speaker and you'd like to speak, just raise your hand. I see most of the questions that have been asked in the, in the chat have been responded to. So please just raise up your hand if you like, you have a question to ask uh, um, either of the speakers. And uh, I'll be given a chance. So we have two, that's it. Or Liwasem, I hope I'll pronounce your name right. And then Frida in that order. Please, uh, Oli, let me just unmute you and then you can go ahead. Uh, hello, hello. Yes. Good morning from here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Please go ahead. My name is Oluwa Sheon Adiemi. I'm from Nigeria. So I just have a comment. Uh, I think when the uh, all the speakers are talking about the uh, understanding youth's participation in this democratic era and the barriers. I think one of the underlying factor that I believe is affecting youth and is not yet addressed, most especially in Nigeria, is our educational sector. Now, you want the youth to, uh, a, 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 an act was signed in 2008 for youth participation, they reduce the age in which you can enter their subsenate. But the question is, you graduate late in school. So how do you expect that you will major with that age? For instance, take me as an example. I graduated, uh, I, I am supposed to graduate at the age of 23, 23 years. But I later graduated at the age of 25 years, all because of strike and a lot of issues like that. Now, after graduating at the age of 25, I was supposed to go to service immediately after graduation. But because of departmental issues, as a result of result not being processed in due time, I have to spend another two years before I go for my national youth service corps that we normally do as a graduate in Nigeria. Now, adding that years together, that's around 27 years already. Now with the youth service, one year, that's 28 years. Now, after you graduate in Nigeria, it's not automatically that you get a job. So you have to look for a job. So before you look for a job, even before you say, look for a job and settle for your whole marital life, age has gone. So to me, I've always looked at it in this aspect that if you want youth indeed to participate in the system or to occupy any political position at a very early stage of life, then education system must be highly addressed. In addressed country, you will discover that most you participate because you would have seen 18, 19 years of old students graduated and some even have master. So if you're able to graduate at the age of 19, 20, you owe your master, automatically you will secure a job. So within two to three years, you are already established. That's why you see them young, they are participating in politics and occupying vibrant positions. So please, if you can turn it to an advocate, that we can advocate that, that our education system needs to be redefined. Redefined to the extent that once you enter a university, the date that you will graduate must be known and must not change. So if this can be done, you will discover that our age with like age of education, the age we spend in the education system is too much. So it will reduce and to participate in other aspects of life will be so, so easy. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Whitney. Thank you. Uh, for those for that. It's actually a wonderful thought. Yeah. Uh, then we'll have Frida. Confirm that you can hear me kindly. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you Youth Cafe for organizing such an amazing session for us. For me, I want to, I'm struggling to remember the last name, the, the name of our last speaker, but there's a very controversial but very good term that he mentioned, cartel. And for us youth to have an impact, in democracy, 
be it be economic de democracy, political democracy, social democracy, we are simply talking about us being present wherever and whenever decisions are being made and development is being made, be it national, be it community, we need to organize ourselves and be a cartel, quote unquote, so that we amass this very powerful force we have in numbers. I had a board of directors of about five organizations in Nembo, and I keep telling them that we need to sit down one day and decide 2027, we're gonna try and put one MCA in the county assembly. And we are going to prove that what it takes is for us youth to be together. So my question is, what is it that prevents the young people to be together for this period that they are, we are young for a very short period? Because like the previous, uh, my, my previous friend from Nigeria said that the youth span is a very short span. But by the time we are done with university bachelor's, of, uh, bachelor's um, degree, there's already a young person who is showing leadership tendencies. There are people who've done politics in the universities as they vie for student leadership. Why don't we agree as young people that we are not split by these politicians, but instead we come together for one of our own? So my question to our last speaker um, is, what are some of the strategies that we ensure the young people come together? Because a vote for a youth by a youth should cost absolutely nothing. And maybe as I end, I just put my face to it. Mm -hmm. That is me. I'm upside down, I can see, but that is me. And thank you so much for the opportunity to ask a question. Thank you, thank you so much. That was also insightful and also a question to all of us as young people who are here. She has suggested you become a cartel. <laughs> So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I see we have several hands, but uh, the time is already so much gone. So please, um, if you can just be able to type your, uh, your, your question in the chat or comment. For those who need materials, uh, we shall be able to share that. So I'll just maybe take one person, Ode. Ode Ogbo. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I, I would like to thank the, the Youth Cafe for such an amazing um, um, program like this. Uh, um, one that tends to bring youth together to share um, in a common issue that affects um, each and every one of us, irrespective of your your country or your location. And um, one thing I would like to say is that um, it's tough to, to be a youth and it's even tougher to be one in Africa. Um, like, as, like my brother has said from, from Nigeria, I think I would love to agree with him. And um, like I did say in the comment session, in the chat box, um, there is no better way of addressing this than going to the root of the issues which is um, overhauling the education curriculum. And once we begin from there, because um, the growth of every nation lies and it either grows or it falls on the education sector. And once that can be properly addressed, I, I always believe that every other thing is will take shape. And also it's not just the guy who, who sits in the corner and points out all the issues that seems to be the good guy, but the one who points the issue and prefers solutions and way forward for that too. And that's something we are not so good at doing in Africa. We are very good at identifying the challenges, um, but when it comes to putting in the work to get these challenges resolved, um, you find people pulling back, which is not something too nice. So what is the action that um, we, are, we are putting in place to make sure that these challenges that I identify are duly addressed because that's something very key and the best time to start doing that is not in the electionary process it is long before that time because it takes 
a lot and a lot of patience and hard work to change a man's mind. So such a conversation like we are having like this should not be one that is seasonal. It's something that should be ongoing, something we keep talking about so that the youth will be, will be aware, will be aware. Because if we keep complaining, the issue will never get resolved. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's an uh, insightful also. So uh, I think th those are the ones we could check for the comments and questions. Uh, so I'll just uh, get it back to the speakers if they are still in, if um, someone wants to respond to any of the questions they, um, they highlighted. So David, Daniel, Vivian, Honorable Victoria and Mike, eight of you can come up. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I have seen uh, a comment that I would begin to quickly address because of time. Um, uh, a brother I've asked, uh, I think this should be David Aludor Aludor, the, the issue about people getting elected and then they don't serve as desired. And uh, there's a an disillusionment. And uh, for him, he is seeing that this is not a matter of uh, any political, but it's a matter of uh, it can be dealt with by people having up in their ideas. But let me inform you, uh, uh, brother, that I agree with the sentiments that most of these young people get into this leadership position with our hope that they are going to deliver. But two things, I am for the opinion that the, the problem to democracy, the problem to participation, the problem to us realizing, this is because we have not understand the psyche of electorates. I have run for a political position in 2013 and by election in 2019. Now there are young people who will support you. Oh, go for it. Go campaign. Run. We are behind you. It happens to any political or candidate. But now when the rubber meets the road, other things come in between. One, oh, now the young people who are supporting you will say, but which party are you running with? Oh, um, you see, we are gathered here a number of young people, 20 of us, we are waiting for you to come and address us. The issue is not you addressing them. The issue is you are not on the ground and you are not felt because handouts and money are not, you're not giving out. Reality is that the electorates sometimes get what they deserve. The sad reality. Because when the youth will say that enough is enough. We want, like my colleague was mentioning, we want to dismantle and not become part of this cartel and not become part of these people who have violated our democracy. You will have leaders who are elected, a young people who are motivated and will lift each other up to run for this leadership position. I, I, I think, uh, Esther, that is what I wanted to, to highlight because there is there is ideal of youth participation, and then there is reality about it. When you begin to participate in these processes, when you begin to be a candidate or to be an aspirant and now a candidate, that process is marred by a lot of things. That is why I have proposed that continuous civic education that is institutional, it is institutional. IBC, the constitution spells that mandate, not when people are approaching election, but even right now, there should ought to have been delimination of boundaries and there would be continuous civic education going on in our curriculum, as has been mentioned, in our institution, or even within our youth constituencies. So if that is not there, and then we are confronted in it when election comes, it becomes so much for us to you know, design in piecemeal. And this, that's why we say, you know, 
I don't hear politics. I don't want to watch news. But I think all politicians are corrupt because we have negated the issue of public office to politicians who are not corrupt and we have little time to understand them. I, I think with that, Esther, um, that, that, that sums it up by really what I wanted to, uh, Thank to address you. that was coming up. Um, thank you, thank, thank you. you so much for you know um, insisting on that. And as the youth cafe being a convener of young people and also you know like uh, youth youth organizations, we will endeavor to to see that we 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 you know like we speak about this and create spaces where young people can be able to get this information. So uh, any other? We have Vivian and uh, Victoria. All right. Uh, we can, you can also share your final comments in the chat. And then I think our last person here will be our, uh, 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 our board member, Zilani. I think you can have a final say and then we'll share the next step on this project. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you Go so ahead, much. Victoria. I think I've moved somewhere. There is no much light. But uh, just to retaliate first, uh, I wish to state that at the end of it all, we understand that uh, having engaging youth in the political space is very challenging. But one thing I'll encourage everyone in this space, we must be intentional and deliberate in this course. We must be intentional and deliberate. For one reason, 2017, I vied and I was told everything. Well, are you married when you say you're not married? They say you see you are not ready to lead. If you say you are married, they tell you go and find where you are. You you are married from. I've seen young women who have been going into political spaces when they now dare to fight. They are told you are not the daughter of this land. You are just married here. Go back to where you come from and fight there. So the space is dynamic, uh, and we have to be deliberate. For me, I got here through a very serious legal battle. I fought for my space, I sued my party, I went to court in it and out until I made it. So it was not that easy. If I would have given up like the many of young people who are denied that space, gave up along the way, maybe I'll not be here. But now I wish to state that even as we do that, those young people, we've had the first person who asked a question from Nigeria about the education system. I, I don't know if legally, what are the thresholds in terms of vying because here in Kenya if you are you have an idea 18 years and above you can go for a member of county assembly seat whether you are still through the education system you are you can still vie the education should not be a barrier in fact for me I see it as a platform whereby you can rally you are, we call ourselves comrades. You can rally your comrades to really support your cause and still make it. Unless it is a threshold, you must be having that degree and have gone through all those processes before you go for that position. And just be creative and exploit all other spaces that exist that will help you leverage and support your campaigns. Just beyond, beyond having uh, resources, we've seen people who've been voted for, they didn't have employment, they did own a home. They were literally almost living in the streets and today they are representing us in our national parliament. So be inspired by those stories. Don't give up on your course. And thank you so much for this platform. That's all I, the remarks I have to make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Victoria. Um, then uh, lastly, I think we'll have uh, Zelani come in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. It's been an exciting uh, conversation. I also would like to really thank the, uh, the speaker, that is Daniel. Vivian, Honorable, Victoria, and Mike for your amazing insights in this uh, conversation. And uh, my parting shots would be around, okay, before I go to my parting shots, thank you to Oliver for being a wonderful moderator as well as Esther. 
And my parting shots would be, I'd like to address the young people. I'm also a young person. And uh, I would like to encourage us, even as we continue with this engagement in the political arena and in, in, all, and in all other strata in, in society, let us always keep an above the line kind of thinking. So when we, when we look at our thought process, it could either be above the line or below the line. Above the line is where we see opportunities, where we see where we are consistent and we keep pushing until we see the changes and not to give up. I can see uh, quite a number of, 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 of us young people want to make, the, make, want to make a difference. Thank you, Frida for those comments. And yes, you, you gave us amazing um, insights that we can work together and form a cartel as a young people to make a difference in this, in this, um, in our society and in Africa. And so as I come to an end, I'd like to encourage us to keep thinking about prosperity, to think about the next generation, not just ourselves, think about our children and our children's children and our children's children and the kind of landscape that we want to offer to them. And if we think that far, we will definitely act today and we will act. Oh, sorry, I had a bit of internet checking, but thank you. Thank you so much for that call. So uh, we have actually come to the end of uh, this session today. So we would like to take this opportunity to, to thank our panelists, that is um, Honorable Victoria, uh, Daniel, and uh, Vivian and Mike. And of course, uh, our moderator, uh, Oliver, and of course, Anzilani for coming in. So as the Youth Cafe, we are so much thankful for all participants for joining us. We have shared the links on how you can be involved in the Ignite African Youth Project. We will be hosting several of these uh, online events, including, you know, um, Twitter spaces and you know YouTube. So keep checking our pages mm -hmm. to get more information on uh, what next on the project. So also please, we have uh, we are conducting a survey to map out uh, youth organizations in Africa. We'll be sharing that with you. So please help us fill that survey. We will also uh, we are also conducting a survey on our knowledge on the many of possible commitments. And that also shall be shared with you. So keep following us, keep you know engaging us. If you have any questions, we you have our emails, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to engage you further. So as we close out today, uh, we we'll just uh, participate in a short poll mm -hmm. as we exit, and then also um at, after you log out of the Zoom, you have a short survey, just please uh, fill in so that you can get your views on how the session went. So thank you so much.